Thank you for inviting me to speak to Jeremko. Thank you all for registering for this session. I really hope that the takeaway for you will be your interest will be peaked to submit an application uh, for Fulbright. Um, I am just honored to be with you all today. My passion is just to broaden the pool of applicants for the Fulbright program. And when I say broaden the pool, I mean community college librarians, librarians from historically black colleges and minority serving institutions, younger uh, early career librarians and archivists, mid-career, senior. So there are so many different programs that you know I'll speak with you about today, but please consult our website um, to learn more. So let me get started. Um, I'm gonna share my screen. I have a, a presentation, a PowerPoint that I designed that hopefully um, will address some of your questions or concerns, but we will certainly have time for some Q and A um, as we move forward. I'm an alumni ambassador and uh, I am the poster child for Fulbright in terms of perseverance because I applied four times before I was finally successful. Um, I did not go to um, the Car Senegal as a librarian. I actually went as a historian. Well, I went as a historian, but just to give you um, some background, I was at the University of Czech Antigio in the Department of English, which offers American studies. And I taught two graduate courses at the university. And Sheikh Antajop is the flagship uh, university. It's uh, 60,000 students are enrolled, but technically over 100,000 actually attend because education is so precious that students will just travel from the villages and from far from places just to have access to, you know, technology, computers, books, journals. And so, um, the government has scholarships that would allow students to attend, but not everyone you, has a scholarship. Useful to give you a bit of background. Oh, okay, so um, okay, so uh, my journey as a as a librarian began as a library fellow in 2015. I received a scholarship from the West African Research Center to be a library fellow. And at the time I was enrolled in a uh, library school, I was in my, my last semester and I applied and I spent the semester in Senegal at the University of Sheikh Antejo at the West African Research Center where I was cataloging and um, reorganizing. Uh, this library was, was basically a, it was comprised of decommissioned archives from the State Department. And so there were journals, there were periodicals, um, you know, I helped with acquisitions, we, we purchased books, uh, there were scholars who contributed books, and so it was a lot of um, just really administration, and no job was too small, it was just a small staff of, of two other librarians, um, really paraprofessionals, they, one had attended the um, EBOD, which is the library school there, it's, um, it's, they train archivists, they train librarians. There is no national library in Senegal. And at the time that I was there, the archive was being demolished. And so I got a chance to go inside the archive right before it was literally being torn down. That was seven years ago. I'm not even sure if it has been relocated or it's open, it's available for research. But um, that was the beginning of my, my experience in understanding librarianship in the country. Um, when I applied as a Fulbright, my French, you know, it's a French francophone country. And so my French was not that strong. So I didn't want to take the chance of not being able to, you know, my application not being successful. So I knew in working with the students that they spoke English, that there was an English department, that there was an American studies program. And so I, I applied to teach African American history with the intention of then making broader connections with archivists and librarians who were in the country. And that's pretty much uh, how it worked out. 
so uh, just I had a letter of invitation. This is the department chair of the English department. It's, his name is Dr. Lewis Mendy. He was also a Fulbright fellow. Uh, he went to Kent State University. His research interests are uh, Christianity and uh, Puritans. And so he wrote his, his dissertation on puritanical um, impressions of the, of the Puritans, which I thought was interesting. Um, but he also specializes in American literature and civilization. So this is just a copy of my letter of invitation. Not every application, uh, every program requires a letter of, of, of invitation, but it doesn't hurt to have one included in your package. As you think about where you would like to go or what you'd like to do, start thinking about what institutions would you be interested in working at. And that's when you begin to draw connections between, you know, contacting someone and making an introduction and just expressing what you'd be interested in doing in that country. So for my classroom experiences, um, I taught two graduate courses entitled How We Get Free and Be Real Black for Me, which were about expressions of African-American public history and civic life. Um, we talked a lot about libraries and archives and museums in terms of preservation and documentation, but the students really wanted to know about gender norms and intersectionality, especially in a country where it's you know, patriarchal and it's it's 95% Muslim. And so we talked about culture, we talked about repatriation, African-Americans wanting to come back to Africa. We talked about racial segregation. Um, a lot of the students would go to the US embassy and they would watch documentaries. And during this time, the most popular documentary was 13. So they really wanted to talk about the 13th Amendment. They wanted to talk about President Barack Obama. They had all kinds of questions like, is there still so much unrest, even though you, you know, have a black president? And they wanted to know about you know, police brutality and, and the state of mass incarceration. So these were you know, questions that they, because they don't have the resources in terms of actual books on the shelf, um, it was important to connect them to broader resources. And so what I did was I created my courses and I offered them on Google Classroom. And that way the students had access to all of um, the resources. You know, if there were documentaries, they were uploaded and available for them. If there were um, PDFs or, uh, you know, an actual book. And, and for me, it was interesting because we would read but I didn't understand because there was the language barrier. And I'll talk about that later. But, you know, the way they learn English is by first learning French. So if they're not well versed in, you know, French, because many of them, their first language is, is Wolof, then they stumble in learning French. And then, of course, they'll stumble in learning English. So that was something I didn't really take into account when I would ask them to read an article, because, as you know, if you've ever tried to, you know, study a foreign language, how long it actually takes to just read one or two pages. And they struggled with, you know, being assigned a 15 page article or even, you know, a book, because I just thought, well, they're graduate students. Certainly, you know, the learning curve is, is not that steep and, and they would be able to do this. And, and that was something that pedagogically I underestimated. But um, like I said, there were so many students in my class, some who were not on the roster, some who just came because they knew that there was an American, that it was an African-American, a, a visiting scholar. And so they would just come just to introduce themselves. And so many of them wanted to do study abroad. So that became my other responsibilities that I was kind of like an ad hoc reader for some of their essays and some of their applications as they were trying to, you know, get an education overseas or, you know, get a scholarship. So I was available and beyond what Fulbright was expecting me to do. So uh, just some of the challenges that um, I talk about. Pedagogically, um, I didn't, I knew that the country suffered from outages in terms of electricity and internet. Um, you know, any given time, the, the, the lights would go out or, you know, the bandwidth would go down. And then the students, you know, even though everyone had iPads and they had iPhones, they would purchase data 
on, you know, a little credit card. And so when they were out of data, they didn't have access. And so they would, you know, couldn't stream videos, they couldn't download the articles. And, and that was a challenge. Um, again, as I talked about, language was an issue. Um, they pedagogically, the way that they learn is rote learning, rote instruction. The instructor will stand in front of the classroom with a microphone and read the text. And then, you know, every now and again would write on the board if there's chalk available. And the students would basically just copy what was written or recite what was said. And that's how they learned. There was no critical thinking. There was no, you know, tell me what you think about this, because they said the way that they are trained, it's disrespectful to question uh, their professor or disrespectful to talk out of turn. And so they just weren't accustomed to my approach of, you know, giving them a scenario and then saying, how would you handle this? Or, or how do you think they felt? And so you know, maybe six or seven weeks into my lectures, they began to loosen up and began to, you know, say, I actually have an opinion or I've read something or could you tell me about this because I have a question about that. And so then the, the learning process became a little bit more engaged. Um, another issue was student demonstrations. Uh, like I mentioned before, the students were on scholarship and this was a scholarship granted from the government and sometimes the money wasn't there. And so the students didn't have money to eat. Um, right now we are a week away from Ramadan. Ramadan is a religious observance where you have to, you know, buy food in preparation for fasting. And, you know, there's, there's certain things that are needed and the students didn't have those things. And so the scholarship wasn't available. They were upset about student fees and, you know, student demonstrations in the past have been physically violent. Um, whereas they, they've struck teachers, they've struck other students, they've you know, sat in front of, of main thoroughways and, and main roads and main streets and you know, tied up traffic and just you know, disinstalled everything. And so when uh, I had a colleague who came from the University of Kansas and he was doing a guest lecturer and right in the middle of his presentation, I saw a group of students that didn't look familiar to me wearing black hoodies and glasses. And I kept looking around and I was thinking, well, you know, because there are so many students who are unregistered, I can't say who is or who isn't in my class. But all of a sudden they stood up and they started speaking in French and I didn't know what they were saying. And one of my students said, Dr. Jones, it's a protest, it's a demonstration, we have to leave. And I'm saying, no, you can't. This man has come all the way from America and he's here to give you this amazing presentation on you know, Muhammad on Lee and, and all these various people. And they just said, please leave. I don't wanna hurt you. And so I was escorted out safely. Nothing happened to me. Uh, the strike lasted about three days. And um, the students, you know, demands were met. They reduced student fees um, and whatever other issues they were upset about. So those were just kinds of things, you know, as, as Fulbright, as a State Department, you, you have to go and you have to check in and you have to say, here are some of the issues. There was no one there to protect me. It was my personal responsibility to make sure that I was going to stay safe. But, you know, I, I made a point of checking in with the State Department just to let them know what was happening. And so, and these are kind of issues that you have to take into account about when it's time for the catalog awards, which countries will be listed in those awards because if it's a place that's not safe, then they certainly aren't gonna send scholars to these countries. So, you know, right now there's a, there's a interest in librarianship and Kosovo and the Ukraine. And so, you know, the catalog of awards had already been set, but what is that going to mean for next year in the years to come? So just in terms of my personal extracurriculum activities, because I was there for nine months, I enrolled in French lessons um, just so that I could be more conversational. I was fortunate enough to be invited to be the keynote speaker for Black History Month at the ambassador's private residence. And so um, I talked about my research in terms of um, civil rights 
and museology because the uh, Museum of Black Civilization had just opened up and I drew parallels between the 100 year struggle of African Americans to establish the National African American Museum in Washington DC and how that worked with Leopold Senghor, the former president in getting a library for the country of Senegal. And so we, you know, we drew those parallels because there were a number of personnel from the National Museum who came to Senegal to help with some of the exhibits. And so as I was given the backstage tour, they were quick to point out, you know, this was something that was contributed and, and this was something that the Americans worked on. Uh, comforts from home, this was the American food store, which is right down the street from the embassy. Um, on, you know, if you were homesick and you were craving something from home uh, during the holidays, Thanksgiving, for example, they offered cranberry sauce and pumpkin pie and collard greens, um, candy, potato chips, you know, you can get Coca-Cola, you can get Doritos, you can get, you know, your brand of, of, of spicy Dijon mustard, you know, ketchup. Of course, it was a little bit more expensive, but um, you know, if you were just craving something just because you were homesick or you wanted something that was familiar, it was a welcome sight for many of us. Uh, this was a restaurant, Mawa's, and it was this woman who lived in Morrisville and she was Senegalese married to an African-American man. And when the restaurant was in Morrisville, it was called Taste of Africa. They then left and went back to Senegal and they opened up a taste of America. So they have chicken and waffles, they have biscuits, they have, you know, Southern um, home cooking and, and Southern cuisine. And it was very interesting because a lot of expats lived in Senegal. So those were just some of the things that, you know, made it that much more enjoyable as I was there during my 10 months. So professionally, um, I got a chance to, of course, go to the library to speak with the, the staff, to go behind the scenes and talk to administrators. We talked about you know, the problems with interlibrary loans. I wanted to get a book, I was doing some research and they told me that it would take anywhere from three to six months. Uh, talking to the students and, and getting them to understand like why is the book not on the shelf? And, and how can we expedite this process and how can we make this better? They were in a, uh, undergoing a huge transformation of digitizing their thesis and their, their dissertations and um, some of their, their newspapers and things like that. So there was a big digitization initiative. University of uh, Michigan was very, very instrumental in helping them uh, through this process in terms of donating equipment and um, staff and training. So I got a chance to observe a lot of these practices. I met a few scholars who were working on endangered archive grants, um, sitting in and talking about the work that they were doing to digitize Ajami literature, Muslim scripts, um, talking about the going to Mali and going to all these other countries and, and working with families to really gather this material, these personal diaries and these, these personal um, religious text so that can be scanned and digitized and translated um, for scholars in the broader world. So uh, there were, you know, IFLA was, was very influ influential, um, International uh, Foundation of Libraries and Archives. There was an IFLA scholar there in the library that I got a chance to speak with. Um, and then here working with students, we did presentations, you know, helping them. Uh, a lot of the students, because the program was American studies, they were studying Toni Morrison, they were studying Ernest J. Gaines, they were studying Ernest Hemingway, Faulkner. And uh, one thing that we did, um, there was a student who was the current library fellow at the West African Research Center, and she and I worked together to create a digital library so that the students who were writing their master's thesis could have current books and articles so they could do their research. A lot of them were interested in critical race theory. A lot of them were interested in, in really contemporary topics, but they were stunted because they didn't have the resources. And so again, going back to the issue of interlibrary loans are pretty much you know, useless. These students now have access to resources through the digital library that we implemented. On a personal note, one of my students um, who was there 
decided he was going to be a translator and he applied to the UN and got accepted as a translator. So he left Senegal, went to New York and had a one year contract working in translations. And when I got back from Senegal, we kept in touch and I invited him to North Carolina and he came to visit me and I took him uh, to Stagville Plantation, which is the largest expand plantation in the state of North Carolina. At one point, it had 800 enslaved persons owned by the Cameron and Benaham family, uh, the family behind UNC, um, the money for UNC. I took him to Dame's Chicken and Waffles, and he had a chance to really see what chicken and waffles taste like because the restaurant in Senegal wasn't that great. I took him to the International Civil Rights Museum. Um, I took him to... Uh, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, because I wanted him to see African American education. I took him to three um, historically black colleges. I took him to Bennett. I took him to A and T. I took him to North Carolina Central, and so he really got a chance to understand what it was like for African Americans then and now to be enrolled in a university. And this is my colleague uh, Buna and Jai. We have been friends since two thousand and five when I went to work at the Center for Documentary Studies. Uh, Buna is, um, had a relationship with Dr. John Hope Franklin and he worked with him for many years and was friends with his son. Um, and Buna had since gone back to Senegal and I was there and I reached out to him and you know, here it was 10 years later that we met for lunch he came and, and met me at the university and we picked up right where we left off. And then when I got back to North Carolina, um, curator Earl Imes, who was from the uh, State Museum, he was having a program about African-American and African foodways. And Buna just happened to be back in North Carolina. And I reached out to him and I said, would you love to come and present on, you know, Senegalese food and the relationship between food there and here? And he did. And so these are the kind of personal and professional experiences that were just made possible and just solidified because I had this experience. Institutionally, um, because I wasn't at UNCG at the time of my application, it didn't really impress upon them of what I was going to do once I got back. But once I got back, I continued to promote the program. I continued to have relationships with other Fulbright fellows and we collaborate on grants and scholarships and programs. Um, and just, you know, to talk about, again, as librarians, we don't think about our, how useful our skills can be overseas. And so I just wanted to share just, you know, here are few people who managed to secure, you know, a 10 month program, a fellowship or a four, four month program. And so all the programs vary. When you look at the catalog of awards, they will specify what the institution is looking for. The biggest problem with a fellowship like this is not being able to have time away from the institution because who is gonna do your job while you're away? Yes, it's a prestigious award and it looks great for everyone involved, but the reality is when you leave, there, there creates a void in terms of, of manpower. But um, they're trying to do more things, offer more opportunities where you could do a, a two year, I mean, excuse me, a two week program or a 10 day program or something like that. So it, it's a range. You're no longer subjected to just a couple of months or almost a year. So there, there are articles there are people have written about their experiences. There, you know, people have talked about their awards. It's always good to look at blogs and things like that because people will tell you about the process of the, you know, application process as well as their experiences while they were there and the takeaway of what happened to them once they got home. So again, like Ukrainian, you know, they're, they're, they're looking for libraries in the Ukraine. And so this was, uh, this person got a 10 month fellowship to lecture on digital library concepts. So what, what areas of need, digitization, digital libraries, cataloging, metadata, uh, reference, anything that's gonna help in terms of professional development and training of staff. This was a librarian from ECU and she was the head of research and instructional services. And she got a Fulbright to go to the Netherlands and to work with her university. So it's, you know, again, it's about compelling stories about 
why do you want to do this and what value is it going to be to the institution and what value is it going to be to you in terms of your personal and professional development? Kosovo, again, these are two countries that are just in, in dire need for librarianship. If we think about, you know, institutional memory that, you know, these countries that have undergone war and conflict, what happens in terms of how they rebuild and what does that mean for resources and, and how do they modernize? So again, any contributions that we can make as, as US historians with all of our resources can greatly benefit other countries of area in areas of need. Um, this, a lot of um, former Fulbrights who work in libraries are now creating lib guides lib guides about the process of being a Fulbright and lib, uh, lib guides about, you know, the experiences and resources that are available if this is a topic that you're interested, in, like this person is public policy. So he's, you know, created a lib guide about social sciences and public policy. Going through the roster, um, I was just curious. I was looking in the Fulbright Scholar Directory, and so far I've counted 354 applicants in library sciences since 1948. So this from 1948 to 2021. And the, the roster, of course, has the name, the institution where they were from, the institution where they served, and uh, the discipline, and then uh, the country. So um, it's, it's good. I don't know. I, I don't believe that, that general, this is not part of general knowledge. You can't go online and access this. I could access this because I'm an alumni. But um, just to give you, a, you know, an overview of, of the kinds of places, uh, China is, is very popular. Um, Europe is, of course, Western Europe is very popular. Um, Czech Republic in 2006, they had a national flood and they made it a point to digitize all the resources that they could. So they have been having, you know, making great headway in terms of digitizing resources and, and training staff and training people to be able to do that. So there's another program, the Public Policy Fellowship. Um, this is where you can lend your expertise to the government. And so it's in three world regions, Africa, the uh, Western Hemisphere, and East Asia and Pacific. And of course, you can go and, and I believe it's three months to 10 months where you can just go and you can shadow um, a government official. And it's a, it's a new program. So I don't know very much about it, but I just received this and I thought, well, this is interesting. I'll have to look into it because they, they do go to Africa and I'm interested in Africa. Uh, so one another program that they have is an academic specialist. And again, these are short term programs. They're projects that could be anywhere from 10 days to 42 days. I think the max is six weeks, which would be 42 days. And the host institution will pay for your accommodations. Fulbright will give you a stipend and um, you basically go and you consult. And so these are kind of mid to mid career to senior career professionals. There's a, you register, you create a, a you, you have to apply. And then if you're accepted, you're added to the portal and it's a roster. So then you access the, the portal. And so I have an example here of what this portal looks like. So when you open it up, there's the home page the roster profile, which would have all of your information, all of your experience and all of your expertise. And then it says open projects. And so that's when all the projects would be available that they're looking for specialists. And so here right now, currently, uh, there's no specialist for libraries. Um, this list comes out monthly. And when you're added to this roster, you serve for, I believe it's three years. So my appointment is um, 2021 to 2024, 23, no, yeah, 2024. And I think, you know, it, I got an extra year because of COVID. But um, again, it's, it's some, if someone is looking for your area of expertise, they will reach out to you or you can check the open projects and you can see who's looking for um, someone with the skills that you can offer. So this, this organization, this Grand Egyptian Museum, they contacted me. And they were looking for someone um, for 42 days to go to Cairo, Egypt. And so this is the project description. This is what they wanted. This was their objectives. 
And it just sounded great until I was like, well, you know, they're talking about hieroglyphics and, and ancient scripts. And, and it was like, it was part conservation. And that was just beyond, you know, the expertise that I could offer. But, but they contacted me because I was listed as an archivist. And so they wanted someone for archiving and preservation to train staff. Um, but really it was, it was handling these ancient artifacts. And I just didn't feel like I was in a position to, um, be that person. And so I respectfully declined. I was very excited to be considered, you know, who doesn't want to be invited to the ball. But at the same time, I was like, yeah, this is, this is beyond my, my expertise. But again, it talks about what the qualifications are, um, the impact of the host institution and, and, you know, this beneficial exchange between cultures. So not only is it about training and expertise, it's really about what Fulbright stands for. And that is being an, a cultural ambassador where you are representing, you know, the United States and you're creating these, these global exchanges and these global friendships. Other institutional opportunities are the school, the scholar in residence program where you can host a scholar from another country to come to your institution. So you could reach out to, you know, a library overseas in Singapore or India or, you know, somewhere China. And you could say, you know, we're looking for someone and, and we want to diversify. We want, you know, some scholar to come from this country and they'll apply and then your host institution, you will host them and, and Fulbright again, will give them a stipend and it's a, it's a great exchange. Um, there's, a, there's a lecturing fund uh, where you could go for two to six days. They're all kind of paraprofessional programs, but really, you know, they're also trying to broaden it so that if you have a personal project, if you have a personal interest, outside of you know your training and and like if you are an outside artist or if you want to do something about you know feminism and 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 librarianship they're certainly open to that because they again are trying to be more broad and the kind of applicants you know fulbright has a reputation that it's elitist that it's for you know top tier institutions and that you have to be this trained scholar and that's not necessarily the case so when you want to start your fulbright your journey go to the catalog of awards um, and you can see that it's you can choose region or you can choose country area or you can select discipline so you you um select like for libraries as a category there are nine awards specifically for library science right now in this current applicant pool so there are specific grants and then there are open areas of of specialties so there are 184 just general awards that if you have a compelling application and you say i want to go to this library in ireland because they're doing these amazing things and you have an, a, a letter of invitation from that institution then you are certainly a candidate to, to apply and you can make a compelling argument as to why you should be chosen to go. So, you know, they're selecting individuals from uh, librarians, administrators, archivists, community colleges, four-year colleges, minority serving institutions, research libraries. You have to be, you know, a full-time librarian. You have to be a US citizenship, uh, excuse me, have US, US citizenship minimum three to five years of professional experience. You have to have an MLS. And of course, you know, mid-career professionals, um, two years into your position, you're really not no longer concerned, con considered early career. So, you know, if you certainly have been writing and researching and, and conferencing and, and doing programs, you are mid-career. Mid so don't be intimidated by, you know, what it says, if you have a compelling argument and, you know, let's just say you've been involved with librarianship before you went to library school, any kind of volunteering, you know, anything that you've done, any service that you've done certainly makes you a much stronger applicant. And again, some grants, uh, some awards do require a letter of invitation. Some may not, but it doesn't hurt to have one. Projects can be single purpose, they can be comparative, you can do administration, you can do teaching, you can do research. It's completely, you know, however you decide, this is the kind of work that I'm interested in doing. 
there's, again, different types of awards. They've distinguished scholar awards. There's a postdoctoral award. There's uh, what kind of activities you can do teaching, research, teaching and research combination or professional project. The application process, it is daunting. It is extensive. It, it, it requires a lot of, of energy um, to really, again, the hardest thing in, in this whole process is you can have the opportunity to do whatever you want to do, but is it compelling enough that someone is going to give you the money to do it? Is it compelling enough that you're going to have the time and the resources to actually put this plan in together? You know, it's not something that you just think on the fly. The application portal opened up in February. The application process is due in September. I guarantee you it will take that long to actually put it on paper to just conceptualize what you want to do and tying together all the pieces between the institution, the place, the, the responsibilities, your skills, your expertise. It's, it's something that you just can't take lightly. You can't think about this in June and say, oh, I think I want to do this. I start thinking about it now. Start thinking about, you know, having uh, writing your statement of, of purpose and then having someone read it and, and go through it and say, again, how compelling is this? Do I, do I sound like I would be a good candidate? And so the process is very competitive. It goes through several rounds. And so there's like peer review and then, you know, you, you go through another hurdle, then there's another review process, you go through another hurdle. There are about three processes. And then the final initial screening, it's the scholarship board. And then, you know, you're selected and it's probably like, um, maybe July or August, and then the most of the awards start in October and November. So it really isn't a lot of time. And of course, if you have a family, you have to think about, you know, what's going to happen. They do have um, stipends for dependents, but that's something to think about. You have school-aged children. Are you going to bring your children with you overseas if you have a spouse? Are you going to, you know, live separately? Um, if you have physical, you know, um, uh, needs, like if you are disabled in some way physically, you have to think all of these, you know, consider all of these things. And so again, if we talk about broadening the pool, we're opening up the pool, you know, we want to consider everyone, everyone, whether they think they have physical limitations or not. And so, you know, trying to think strategically about where you serve. I mean, you certainly can't go to a country that doesn't have a good health system or doesn't have good infrastructure. That wouldn't be wise if you have other you know, concerns. So if you also want to think about if you are single and you're female, how to travel, you know, alone. And, and if you're in a country that is, you know, patriarchal and, and, you know, they don't really think about women and women's rights and things like that, that's something you have to consider. You have to consider if you are, you know, LGBTQ, is this country open to that type of lifestyle? So these are, again, as you are thinking about where would I like to serve, where would I like to go? This isn't just travel. This is just living in the country and being part of the culture. And if you aren't comfortable doing that, if you're not, com not comfortable stepping outside of yourself, this is probably not the program for you because once you get there, you're on your own. Um, you've got to figure out all of these things. I mean, I got to the university and it was October and they were in the middle of taking exams and I'm, you know, going trying to figure out how to get my ID and, and trying to get access to the library and, you know, what documents do I need? And so it was, it was very daunting. And, you know, if you're a person that is just not going to take initiative, Again, this is something you have to know yourself and know who you are before you want to endure in a program like this.